right? Yeah. 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 Just as I was starting to get into this stuff, I had been following along with a lot of that. Really? So yeah. you're into, you're steeped in the open source culture? Or how do you feel about the open source? I'm fully with it. Uh, I think the the difficulties we've had is we've tried to share with another group and kind of got burned on it a little bit in the sense that uh, what happened there um, well it started out with them claiming credit for our work mm. and then going out and raising a bunch of money with that um, and so it just kind of left a, a bit of a bad taste <laughs> Did they did they proceed pr proceed and succeed with it or they burned? Uh, they're still they're still working they're still working. Um, mm -hmm. But anyhow, I think it's um, yeah. For me, I know that to succeed in the project, it's got to be more people working on it than me. Um, you are you the primary? I, so I, I work on the technical side primarily, uh -huh. and I'm. You know, I don't know enough or, you know, have enough time to, to possibly get it where it needs to be. So uh -huh. I'm all for it because I yeah. want to see the impact, you know, and I feel like getting it out is, is what's got to happen. Yeah. Uh, what's the current state of the, of the machine? Is it pretty robust or? Uh, no, I would say quite delicate. PET is super difficult to uh -huh. extrude. Um, material properties uh, being the, probably the big issue, uh -huh. uh, and then also trying to do that on a small scale, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with items that are not specialty designed for PET, just make it a lot more complicated. Is your background uh, technical? Uh, so I've got a degree in mechanical engineering. Okay. For the, some mechatronics, but um, I mean, I would say pretty basic. And I mean, like what you you know, the, so that's like an undergraduate degree, um, and then you know, most of my learning on say circuitry and so on is pretty much what I picked up off of YouTube, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like it's like you, I mean, you know, the the kind of you get exposed to most of the basics, yep. but then really when it comes down to it, you gotta, you gotta dive in and learn on your own. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing a lot of just kind of that. how do you, like I, I don't fetch my own boards or anything like that. How did you run into the people from Michigan tech? So Dr. Pierce. Well, so let's see, I'm trying to remember when I met Joshua Pierce. We've never met face to face. Um, but so I went back to school specifically to do 3D printing and development. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer a number of times. Um, and access to parts has always been an issue. So I, when, I, uh, when I found out about 3D printing, what was that, like 2009 or so, I was like, ah, that's what I'm doing. So yeah. I went back to school. Um, What's the status of the Tech for Trade project altogether? So what we're doing right now um, is, uh, let's see, so we've developed a printer um, that we can make locally in most parts of the world, you know, kind of with a minimum amount of imports. So basically you import ramps and mm -hmm. um, that's about it. And then we grab everything else. Uh, locally, like including stepper motors, we just take them from the electronic waste stream, power supplies, that sort of thing. Um, we make our own, well, we can make our own heated beds, but we frequently the ramps comes with them, so we just use those. Um, okay. So we've started. Let's see, we've got three groups: one in Nairobi here, one in Tanzania, and one in Ghana that are making printers. And selling those, hmm. um, and so that was actually after we started working on the filament. We st like started working on the filament, but it's been a pretty complex uh, process. Um, we started with HDPE, 
could make filament, but it's terrible for printing. Then we moved on to ABS, which if you're sourcing from waste, you've mm -hmm. got to be really careful about uh, flame retardants. And so in the settings that we want to work in, just you can't guarantee that people aren't going to be pulling computer cases and stuff like that. So we backed off from ABS. And Pull, what? Pulling and, computer cases? What do you mean? Yeah, so like, uh, so uh, many of the electronics casings are made from ABS. Yeah. So it would be tempting to grind those up and use them for filament. Instead of using yeah. computers? Hmm. You mean like they would they would be what? People would be stealing like, computer cases or what? So like <laughs> in the electronic waste stream, so say like a printer, you got your desktop printer there and the plastic casing yeah. is frequently like ABS or um, uh, what, like high impact polystyrene, things that, that you could print with. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also, uh, they've got flame retardants in them, and especially the older flame retardants are, can be neurotoxins, and they don't bind to the plastic very well, so um, I see. when you heat them up, you could, yeah, it's, <laughs> so anyhow, after, you just read a couple papers on that, and it's scary, you know, it, it's scary enough for me to... <laughs> Wow. What about that. what about things like car bumpers? Is that safe? So car bumpers may be safe, but even so I, I read a paper on say like car dashboards. Yeah. And there are even standards on those. So like if people put a, a lit cigarette on a car dashboard, it's gotta be able to not burst into flames. Um so oh. You know, like you would think, like say refrigerators that hmm. you know they're designed for food ca contact, they're probably okay. But the, you know, it doesn't really take. You know, it's like you just get a little bad in the mix, and then I didn't want. I just didn't want to risk it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other the other issue with those things is it's not. Um, not in. I don't know what I like the mainstream, the main waste stream, right? That's like kind of a, uh, you go to the car junkyard to get those. Whereas say like bottles are pretty much ubiquitous. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah. like any town you go to in the world, there are bottles. Um, so that's why we decided to focus in on PET because it is quite printable. Bottles are primarily PET. So, well, like uh, soda pop bottles, water bottles, things like that, they're all... Detergent the bottles? One. What? Detergent bottles? Like soap detergent? Well, those are frequently HDPE. Okay. Um, milk jugs are HDPE. Hmm. Um, okay. I mean, you can have limited printing success with those. Like, uh, we, uh, when I was at University of Washington, we printed a canoe on a really large format. 3D printer that we made out of a out of a, a plasma. It was like a plasma cutter, CNC plasma cutter that was broken, so we kind of yeah. hacked it and, and did that. But print quality was pretty low, um, or exceedingly low. Um, you know, we got it to float. Um, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, <laughs> tell me about the the digital blacksmith network what's the status of that okay so the idea there is that um in a lot of places there's limited access to products um that could you know be very useful our, our big big example right now are the microscopes um mm -hmm. so um what we want to do is take, I mean, the, the internet's loaded with designs, like, you know, a lot of great designs for things, but they aren't products yet. Right. Frequently, frequently they're like, I mean, I don't know. That no, I hear you. I mean, there's, there's like, if you want a commercial product or a marketable product, that's, I mean, we're, we talk about the same thing. I mean, you're talking about when, when, I mean, the, the idea appears to be the same. 
which is let's get a few awesome product designs out there that can be open source that can then yeah. spawn a massive movement of productivity within a population. That's where I think the economy is going by people yeah. like yourself or ourselves. We make that happen and that will clearly be the dominant way that things are made in the future. I have no, no question about it. But yeah. right now we are still pretty much in the dark ages of open source. So uh, not, yeah. not many people see this coming. And so I think for us right now, it's um, like I could envision, say, someone with access to, to those products in a shop that could start producing them. Um, I, I can yeah. envision how they would make money. The, our stumbling block right now is figuring out how we survive. You know, so, right. so developing, developing that stuff um, is... Uh, it seems to be pretty new ground for funders, <laughs> um, and so so I think that's also part of um, uh, where say the business side of the team is maybe more interested in. Once we've got it all packaged up and done and ready to go, that we would try and get the designs out rather than hey, let's get it out early on and attract. Yeah, I mean, there's there's different ways to, to run a business model on that. And to me, I mean, the answer is somewhat obvious if, you, if you're willing to go the extra mile up front. And that is you, you're the entrepreneur yourself. That's what we do. We, we develop stuff, but how do we get paid? We, paid? we get paid by producing. So that's a sure bet way to, to do that. So we produce workshops, and, but we also do want to set up micro factories. So first, one, one of our own. And then when we figure that out, that we make money by, by replicating that, by teaching people, by setting that up all over the world. So that's that I think it's basically an education model. It's the good old university. That's that's yeah. a very profitable model. <laughs> As you look at the bu burgeoning campuses that, right? all over the world. Yeah. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so that's kind of the. I mean that sounds exactly the way I'm kind of thinking is like yeah you know, even once you once you get the the designs together and working and you know at a level where you are you know fixing half of the time right um, you know it's it takes an enough uh, uh, what knowledge or, or experience to get it going that the service you know, there's a there's a market for that service to, to help right and stuff. and the biggest challenge is getting collaborators onto that brainwave of thinking because mm -hmm. it's tough but at the same time you only need so much to make it a success with a collaboratively pooled effort so that's mm -hmm. that's the idea now we're actually gonna do a hero X I don't know if you've heard of hero X but we're gonna do it on a on a cordless cordless power drill construction set we're going to call it actually the open source micro factory challenge but the first product that people are going to design is is the the cordless drill that's a professional quality that can be made locally uh, basically open sourcing the whole production tool chain for for starting with a cordless drill and then moving on to other cordless power tools and other tools as well so um, one of the products in there yeah I mean definitely the cordless drill but then you add a few more a few key products that you have each of those you know each like a cordless drill for example is a billion dollar market by itself in the united states alone so there's uh -huh. there's plenty of opportunity to basically to do the import substitution or, or like the open source substitution of products out for what's what's out there yeah now the value uh, proposition uh, being you, when, when you guys do development yeah um where in the process post designs from the beginning once it's stable before we start <laughs> the answer is publish early and often like open source before we even start yeah, yeah. i mean right now yeah. you, you go to go to facebook you'll see the you know the design of the gas control system for the cnc torch table that we're going to be building this weekend things like that you got to publish early and often. it's basically creating a community i mean that's how we operate and that that works for us Yeah. Uh oh. Um, yeah. Let's see. The, the network just flickered a little bit. I'm like tethered through my uh, 
cell phone, so hopefully if yeah. it works out that week. Um, yeah. I might have to shut the video down if it starts getting rough. How's, um, um, yeah, right. So um, do you have any designs that, that you can share, like the files and all that? So, so that's where I'd have to talk with William um, to just to make sure everyone's cool with, with uh, putting stuff out before we... I think the goal was what we what we wanted to do was put a video together that just says, "Hey, here's where we are," kind of demonstrating mm -hmm. what we've accomplished. Um, uh, yeah, just because of that, I think that rough experience earlier was uh, <laughs> might have made people a little more skittish. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, the, the goal is to get everything out there. I personally hope that, you know, we're publishing, you know, like every day, if there's a design change, we, we get it up there. Um, when, when are you going to have that discussion with that? That'll be, I mean, I've already been, we, we've already been talking about that a bit. Um, I think it's, especially with, that the bridge article came out, it's kind of more, uh, getting more important to, to finish that conversation and, and move on, you know, and hopefully just kind of start attracting a larger group of people interested in contributing to the project. Because um, mm -hmm. pretty much until now, well, still now, it's been, um, so I've been the primary developer on everything, and then um, there have been a few people that we've consulted uh, but for pretty small parts of the project. And so for me, you know, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not a computer scientist. And so, you know, doing all the parts is it's just a lot for me to juggle yeah. and keep up the documentation, blah, blah, blah. So uh, yep. that's, that's been the big struggle and why I would really, <laughs> you know, I'm very interested in, in working with you guys if, if, if you would be able to help push the project forward. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, so when do you, be, go ahead. yeah. When do you think you, I mean, like as far as, you know, I mean, we, for us on our side, I mean, where, where are we going with this for us would be to replicate from what you have. And mm -hmm. if, I mean, if it's working in a decent way and, and it's, it's a decent design, we'd want to build it out as soon as we can. We could get somebody here to, to produce it or possibly run a workshop to, to actually build it, depending on the state of the documentation. Typically what we like yeah. to do is, is if something is relatively well developed and documented, we, we continue on the documentation to the point where we can run a workshop and then invite people to, to build that with us. So yeah. we can do basically these weekend builds where we do a lot of preparation before that and then have a rapid build. That's, that's how we do it. Uh -huh. um, but if, if, if it's available, I mean, I definitely would want to take a look at it and, and run forward with it and make it work, make it a viable product. Yeah, so. it's, um, so the, the, the film, I mean, just to, to keep you in on, on where it is, so the filament we're producing, we can, I mean, I don't know if, did, did um, Joshua send you the picture of the microscope we printed? No. Is there like a file thing I can pop? Yeah, I mean, you can put a link. Can you put a link into the, the chat box on the left-hand side? Oh, there it is. It pops out of the Drop off. You're able to get like how much consistency, like plus minus oh, so that's 0.05 the, millimeter or... So... Um... I don't know what happened there. I, I saw a pic my picture went up, but then you disappeared. Did you put anything in the chat box? Yeah, I did, and you it, you disappeared when 
I did that. Can you try it again? Just pop it into the text spot there. Yeah. So it cut, for some reason when I put it into the chat box, it cuts okay, you off. Let me cuts just, me uh, okay. just attach it. Well, but anyway, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um. so, so on the diameter, the, um, the issue is is that we, we haven't been able to get totally consistent diameter yet. So what we've done to um, get consistent prints is set up the printers with um, a, um, a diameter sensor. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Is that a capacity and, within within Marlin? Yeah. So I had to. So so Marlin is able to accept that. Um, but the, the issue was, um, I'll send you the, the image later. It's anyhow, the prints are, are I would say, pretty great. Um, like we can print a microscope that works just fine. Like quality is pretty much equivalent to what I'm making with, with commercial filament. Wow, um, that's pretty neat. Is, is the technology for the filament <clears throat> width sensing, is that relatively accessible or did you guys develop it or so no it's an open source uh project it's on thingiverse um and so i i mean it's still so so that that sensor even our our modifications to the sensor we're still developing um but that'll all get posted out as well um the issue that we had is so it's a sensor that basically a, a um, basically a CCD array with three LEDs, so it basically produces shadows of the filament from three different angles, and then figures out an average diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, with the transparent filament, um, can you see my screen? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Is it if one of these things? For filament with sensor. Um, I think there's an earlier version of one that uh, Flipper put up. By Flipper, yeah. There's a Flipper one. Um, okay, so if we go to his. Uh, so that's kind of where it started, and then. You know, oh wait, there it is. It's the actually it's the the kitty corner to that one. This one. Yeah. March three, twenty fifteen. Yep. So that's the one that. Um, that I used, um, and the thing that's nice about it is that it helps uh, deal with uh, oblong filaments. Um, so we're close to licking the out of roundness problem, um, but not quite there yet. Um, so, so that basically you can put oblong filaments through your printer and uh, that'll help adjust for it. But how does that, so Marlin, there's a feature in Mar, how do you activate it in Marlin? Yeah, so there's a, a feature in Marlin that, um, that basically you just, if you, there's a, a filament width sensor and so you can uncomment that and that activates the filament width sensor. In configuration.h? Yep, it might be in advance. No, I think it's it's down near the bottom of configuration.h. Huh. Um, and so then uh, you can actually modify Marlin slightly, and the Marlin then the the filament width sensor, um, basically between the two firmwares, you can set it up so that if the 
filament goes above a certain size or below a certain size, it will initiate a change filament routine. Or if the filament runs out, it'll initiate a, a it'll pause the print and initiate a, a, a change filament routine. So you can actually like the, I I, I kind of hacked in that code so that say I could use sections of filament that were decent. Um, so if wait, have, so like, it doesn't. So the the way it works, it doesn't actually slow and speed up the filament feed. You have to. It just stops it. It no. It does. It does slow and speed up the filament. So so I have successfully printed with filament that range like our worst filament, which ranges from say like uh, one point three millimeters up to uh, two millimeters in diameter, and it evens out the print quite well. Um, although I'm still tuning the algorithm for edge detection because when the when the filaments oblong it doesn't the the algor the original algorithm the, it doesn't always catch the edge yeah um, because of because the the, the filament kind of acts like a lens and when the filament rotates that the the bright spot can kind of shift um have you talked to the the guy? What is it? In ornate, you talked to that guy. I or? haven't yet, um, but yeah, that would be something on the list. Pretty much for the past few months. So I just got this working. The other thing we've done. So we're, we've basically been developing from bottle all the way to print. So I've created a, a, a chopper that actually makes the flake for the plastic. Um, and um, hmm. pretty much I've been scrambling to get all that stuff working enough that we can come here and start implementing it. Um, so that, you know, that kind of goes into the conversation of, yes, I want, <laughs> I, I need help. I, I need more help in this. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, so... Yeah, but I, I really thought this was great work on the film with the sensor. Um, yeah. The, no, that's a, that's a great thing. thing. That's, you know, imagine you got all kinds of crappy filament and then you're just printing perfect prints with anything that comes your way. That's a very useful feature. Yeah, totally, totally. And it's the other great thing is it's low cost. Now, here's the, the big issue with the filament with sensor is that the, the CCD array was recently discontinued. Uh-huh. Um, and I haven't been able to find a replacement for it yet. I haven't searched too hard. I haven't really had a ton of time to dig into it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the issues. Then back to the filament extruder. So one of the things that I've developed that I'm itching to get posted and get some assistance on is a diameter sensor for the extruder. Um, Mm. And so the issue with PET is when it melts, it's a uh, very low viscosity. Um, so industry does all sorts of stuff and invests a lot of time in upping the viscosity of the PET from the, the recycled waste. And there's additives you can put in and there are, are methods you can use to extend the chains, um, which on our scale and our locations don't really seem like... What is the any... technique for extending the chains? Is it temperature control? Yeah, Pressure? it's like a, I, I talked to one engineer about it, uh, let's see, it was a couple of years ago, I think. Um, I think they basically heat it and heat the flake and mix it at, uh, at I want to say, higher temperature, possibly under vacuum, for a length of time, and the, the, the chain ends find each other and, and kind of uh, merge together. So, like, at a given time, you kind of get a given increase in, in chain length, you know, and it's, it's, I would be, I, I would be guessing. <laughs> Is your system, you does your system have cooling, like, sorry, does your system have cooling underwater? Yes, we do. Um, and so the issue is that as the pressure varies in the extruder, that 
uh, the filament emerging from the machine, um, say as, as that diameter changes, it shoots right into the water and, and cools quickly. So we have to catch the diameter just as it's going into the water um, and it's in a state where you can't touch it. So I've designed a, a laser diameter sensor um, that you know, it's kind of like what you what you see in the industry that, that you know has a laser shining across the, the filament. Um, and there's a uh huh. Um, so anyhow, yeah, the, like again, those are I would say at the working but not working perfectly phase, and we're right where we're about ready to start turning on feedback control on the extruder. Um, so that would hopefully eliminate the need for the sensors on the printers. Um, yeah. I haven't successfully done it yet, so. Do you think the printer route is not really scalable? I, I think it's a good route, actually. Um, the reason being that if you equip your printers with those diameter sensors, you know how, say, you switch... Uh, filament suppliers, you got to check your filament diameter to make sure you're getting the right extrusion rate. With that film three, you just throw it in and the printer takes care of the rest. I think it's like it's breaking up there for a second. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you can just print right down to the end of a spool and the printer will stop and you can throw in more filaments. So I see a lot of advantage to using that. Um, the issue that we see is, can you get everybody to adopt that? It, you know, for the open source community, you know, for, for um, let's say for people who are building their own printers, they're likely to say, "Oh, sure, I'll upload a new a new version of Marlin that's you know and change the configuration to do that." But then there are also you know growing number of users who just want to press print. So if their printer doesn't come equipped with that, they're probably going to be you know they're probably not going to make the change. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a filament that meets kind of commercial standards, I. No, that's definitely the target. Yeah. Yeah. Just because it cuts out complexity on the user side. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. So, um, yeah. What What next? So, uh, as far as getting an answer from your your boss or, or what's his name, William? You said. Yeah, William. Yeah. So, so as far as William, I mean, uh, maybe maybe talk to him and let me know what happens there because I mean we can't really do anything until that point. Kind of, so what kind of stuff might your group be able to help out with? We can do the full CAD and open source CAD and mm -hmm. we can get people on any, we can, we have different people that can do different things. So if whatever technical issues there are, we can look into either recruiting people. We we're building an HR team where we're actually recruiting actively for various subject matter experts. So we can make a call out for it. And so just, just with our social capital, well, that we can yeah. potentially develop, um, get some more developers on this, or commit mm -hmm. some of our people. But what we can do definitely is, I mean, we can CAD it up in terms of doing the full open source CAD. We use FreeCAD, so we got a good, yeah. good CAD team of people that we yeah. can do that. And then all kinds of instructionals, and we're actually doing, for example, WebGL explosions that are embeddable into websites. We're developing tool chains for that. What we would do is develop a tool chain for effective production of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, develop how to build one of these things in a single day. That's what we do. We do we do that for all of our work. We uh -huh. come up with production engineering to to do rapid build workshops. So that's that's the thing right. we we would do. We could do. Yeah, that that would be great. So um, yeah, I guess uh, then next steps would be for me to talk to William and get back to you as as soon as possible. Um, yeah, there's uh, a load of stuff where, where I feel like someone with some specialty knowledge could really make a, a push the machine forward quite a bit. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Great. Yeah. All yeah. right. Um, no, that's. Uh, when do you think that that'll happen? What kind of? When, when do you think he, he can? Uh, also leave. Let's see. I think he just just one leave last week. So probably another week before he comes back. Okay. Uh, and then I. So I'm in Nairobi until mid-November. Um, and things have just like things that I did not think were think were going to be an issue have become like major stumbling blocks at finding a motor. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> so, um, Sounds like you uh, need yourself an open source micro factory to produce all these things for yourself. That, yeah, we would we would absolutely you know that's kind of kind of the idea is, is doing that kind of stuff. I, I, one of our constraints is how do you do that when you don't have Amazon to get a linear bearing. Um, or something mm-hmm. like that, you know. So, so there's that that additional constraint, right? To, you know, make things a, a, a little uh, a little interesting. Do you have um, aluminum, steel, and copper waste streams that are available? Uh, yes, there are. So, like foundry stuff. Um, one of the, one of the areas I've been very interested in getting into is uh, small scale CNCs. For uh, making molds uh, for small scale plastics um, stuff. Uh, so I see, like that in combination with 3D printing, to me, just seems like a, a great combo because you can, you know. What's the case for molds if you have a 3D printer? Um, just production capacity. Okay. Um, and the other, the other nice thing about that is, is with the with the molds, you can switch to HDPE, um, which is a lot easier to to. Um, I wouldn't say it's easier to source, but it's easier to work with. Like with PET, if if so, PET absorbs; it's hygroscopic. Yeah. And um, when you heat it up, it actually breaks down. Um, if there's water in it, well, it breaks down anyway, but it break, water basically hydrolyzes the, the polymer. So with HDPE, there's just not as many issues working with it. Um, Would H- HDPE work well in a heated chamber, or what's needed to make it work well? Uh, yeah, you would need a heated chamber, and even then, it, it crystallizes as it cools. So, mm-hmm. um, I, I initially I spent a ton of time trying to print with HDPE and was never successful. There was another guy we worked with. In, uh, he's located in uh, Pune in India. Um, they're called Proto Print, and they've been working quite a bit. I I don't know if they ever got to adding fillers to it. So if you if, like, you might be able to use another strategy, like say mixing short chop fiberglass or talc powder into the HDP, you know, to make more of like a composite material. Um, that might help reduce the shrink, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, it was just such such a headache to print with. Um, you know, whereas the, P, the PET, like, I mean, it prints as well or better than PLA. Um, so... You know, like tea glass, like it prints nicely. It also crystallizes as it cools. Like just so you know, maybe a little bit more of the, the technical on that. Um, so crystallization is so. There's the t- the two big issues, or I guess three would be. One is temperature. So it melts at a really high temperature. Um, that means if there are any other plastics mixed in, they tend to char by the time PET melts. So contamination mm-hmm. is an issue. Um, with um, the uh, let's see here, I just lost my train of thought. Um, the crystallization, you've got to get the temperature down quickly. If you don't get the temperature down fast enough, it crystallizes and it becomes glassy and brittle. Um, so, initial when we initially printed stuff, um, we would get things that would just shatter 
you know, you just bend the part. It just, I mean, it's kind of scary. You have to have your glasses on for sure because as it bends, it bends, 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 and then just explodes. Um, and then the third is moisture. So it'll absorb moisture out of the air. So that means um, if you're using wet filament, it will foam up as it comes out of the level, uh, which causes all sorts of headaches yeah. and, and uh, issues. So yeah, there's a, a, another thing to, to deal with on, yeah. the, on the print side. Yeah. Well, all right. Okay. So, all right, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, yeah, and hopefully we can we can get this thing get this thing rolling. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, let me know what Matthew thinks about it. Is there? Do you have a larger team like Matthew is a person? Is there a whole bunch of other people that are opposed to the idea of of fully letting this go? Or so I don't think there. I think opposed is maybe the wrong word. It's, I think the feel is more like we've been hunting for funding. Like funding is all you know. Funding's a, an issue, you know, to get to get this rolling for us. Um, and uh, so I think the main concern is losing thunder. Um, you know, saying, look at what we did. <laughs> Whereas I, I mean, part of me thinks, um, you know, especially because we feel like we're in the last mile now. Um, uh, but then, you know, I feel like, don't we get a lot of thunder if we say, look at who we're collaborating with, look at the, the power of, of the community that's, that's, uh, helping move this forward. Um, yeah so, yeah definitely yeah. yeah that i mean i think that's that's the thing you know uh, uh the rest of the group comes from business you know traditional business where uh ideas are protected and that sort of thing so um, yeah i mean the only thing you can do in my opinion is just show the show the business case of what i mean what's the revenue model and so you just have to say okay it's a training model it's a it's a workshop, it's a production model. I mean, you just have to get creative on that part and say, here are the numbers. So so come up with a case for that. Uh -huh. um, is there stuff maybe on your site that I could share with them? You know, stuff that, that might strengthen my case than me just talking off the top of my head? <laughs> no, not, not particularly. The deal is that we haven't shown... Uh, a viral replication example yet while we're getting supported by doing this and we run workshops we're bootstrap funding nobody else has done it yet so until uh, we get to that point which should be uh, I mean we're we're looking at getting this 3d printing enterprise I mean there's the tractor is very very close to the point of going potentially viral and things like that but that has to happen first before we uh, we can make a solid claim here. Look at the economics. I personally uh -huh. think that the that the 3D printed cordless drill may be a case where you see, okay, now we've got this amazing design, and many people are actually able to go into business because of that. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's too early to to have those case examples. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, if the people on your team don't see it, it's it's kind of hard. I mean, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a real friendship. I mean, the the groups that that I think of off the top of my head would be say like uh low spot um yeah i mean that's the only case you can say you can say the two large two most successful 3d printing companies today are open source that's that's low spot and that is prusa and you can tell them that low spot is the fastest growing computer company in in the united states i mean that's that oh, speaks for itself yeah I think you, you can That's make a clear case for open source. People confuse open source and the which is a development technique and the revenue model. You don't you shouldn't confuse those. The, the idea is those are separate items. Open source yeah. is a development process. The revenue model you have to make your money somehow. The open source is not inconsistent with with the revenue model. 
just have to come up yeah. with a revenue model that works for them but it can't be a uh the the same old same old i'm going to protect ip and and corner the market you're guaranteed yeah. not to succeed in terms of changing the world that's all yeah. i can say and the way the way development's going now i mean someone just needs to look at your device and they've got access to all the tools they need to to <laughs> replicate it so like someone in in the u.s isn't doing there's doing it there's someone else in the world that's yeah, I mean, the only thing you can say to your people is, look, man, like when we distribute that, just think about the power that comes from that. The power of economics comes from how many people you're serving. So, I mean, I think there's a very clear case that you, that economic power will return back to you when you are serving people. So focus on doing that good work and don't worry about yeah. the rest, you know. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about the... Uh it'll uh, it'll be there mindset. i mean it's it's just, it's just a scarcity mindset that we're dealing with it's it's like just people who think that there's not enough for everyone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly so, there's too much plastic that's the that's the no, there's sure. there's plenty for everyone and especially in this business so in the business yeah. of plastics <laughs> so okay but anyway um yeah let's talk after after you have your discussion see where we go from there see if we can use that and and definitely we can uh, we'd love to collaborate on the development part and make yep. it make it a real product. Yeah. Sounds great. Well, it's been great talking with you. Yeah. All right, Matthew. So thanks a lot. Thanks for the time, and we'll be in touch then. Okay. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.